Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for the Latino Surgical Society Inside the Operating Room. My name is Gez Ortega, and I'm an assistant professor of surgery and lead faculty for research and innovation for equitable surgical care at the Center for Surgery and Public Health in the Department of Surgery at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. On behalf of the founders of the Latino Surgical Society, I want to welcome you all uh, this evening. Uh, and I extend a warm welcome um, to everyone. The Latino Surgical Society was established to cultivate, nurture, and support the advancement of Latino surgeons, and today's event is in line with this mission. We want to thank all of you, our members, for supporting and believing in the Latino Surgical Society, as well as our institutional members. And before we get started, I would also like to thank the team that makes these sessions possible. Aldo Trevino, and the Latino Surgical Society web intern, C Christian Puerta, the Latino Surgical Society social media intern, and the co-directors of the Inside the Operating Room series, Dr. Oscar Salirosas and Dr. Alexandra Hernandez. Tonight, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Patricio Polanco for the latest installment of our series. Dr. Polanco is an associate professor in the Division of Surgical Oncology in the Department of Surgery at UT Southwestern Medical Center. He serves as the director of the Robotic Surgery Training Program at UT Southwestern, as well as the co-director for the Pancreatic Cancer Program. He also leads the Peritoneal Surface Malignancies and High Peck Program at UT Southwestern. A native of Peru, Dr. Polanco graduated as valedictorian of La Universidad de San Martín de Porres Medical School. After completing his surgical training in Lima, Peru, he moved to the United States where he completed a postdoctoral research fellowship in a general surgery residency at the University of Pittsburgh. During his training, Dr. Polanco received several prestigious accolades, including the Alpha Omega Alpha Honors Medical Society, the Charles Seymour Teaching Award, and the Gold Foundation Humanism and Excellence in Teaching Award. He later pursued a complex surgical oncology fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, joining UT Southwestern in 2014. Dr. Bolanco's research interests includes health services research, disparities in surgical outcomes, and pancreatic cancer. He is also the site principal investigator for several clinical trials for pancreatic, pancreatic cancer. Dr. Polanco is a recognized educator and investigator in the field of robotic surgery, training, and simulation. His research has been presented in national and international meetings, and he has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles in several surgical and cancer journals. Dr. Polanco serves in several committees and leadership positions of academic associations, including the Americas Hepatopancreatico Biliary Association, Society of Surgical Oncology, American College of Surgeons, among others. He also serves in the Pancreatic Cancer Expert Panel for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN guidelines, and Dr. Polanco's commitment to the advancement of medical knowledge extends globally as he has trained and guided several international surgeons in establishing robotic surgery HPB programs. Furthermore, his extensive experience in medical mission trips to Central and South America highlights his dedication to providing healthcare access to underserved populations. Welcome, Dr. Patricio Polanco, and thank you for joining us today. I would like to also welcome our guest session moderator, Dr. Andres Abru. Dr. Abru obtained his doctorate of medicine in 2020 from La Universidad Central de Venezuela in Caracas, Venezuela. Dr. Abru is completing his postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Throughout his fellowship, he has immersed himself in surgical oncology outcomes, healthcare costs and surgical education research with an emphasis on robotic surgery curriculum development, the incorporation of artificial intelligence in surgery and addressing health disparities. Currently, Dr. Abru is applying for a general surgery residency in this current match cycle. Welcome, Dr. Andres Abru, and thank you for being our guest moderator. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortega. Um, when thank I'm you, Dr. Ortega, for the kind introduction and, and uh, for the privilege and pleasure of being here. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real honor to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, I thank you both and um, I'll, I'll let you both take it from here. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, well, buenas noches to all the audience. Uh, thank you to the Latino Historical Society for this great honor and for allowing me to interview my mentor and the mentors many, uh, Dr. Polanco. So boss, why don't we get right into it? Um, you know, 
we kind of get got spoiled a little bit with your with the bio uh telling us that you were from Peru but why don't you tell us with your own words where do you come from and why do you choose a career in medicine and then in surgery Thank you. Thank you, Andres. And again, thank you to the organizers, uh, Dr. Sally Rosa, Dr. Ortega, Dr. Hernandez, and the rest of the team. Uh, again, I cannot emphasize enough how, uh, what an honor is to be here. I just cannot imagine that anybody would like to join for one hour to hear uh, things about me. So if, if I am just surprised that anybody will actually join to do that. But since we're here, uh, <laughs> we'll just go for it. Um, I, I would say, uh, you know, Andres, I think uh, we all have different paths. And I, I, the easy answer would be, you know, my dad was a physician, therefore I wanted to be a physician. But I actually fought the idea of following my dad's steps until I was 15 or 16. And for me in Peru and many uh, in, in Latin America, we don't have the college system where you go four years until you figure it out and you get a, you know, like a major or a minor in these, and then you go to medical school. You kind of have to make the decision really early on. And uh, I think until I was 15, I, I felt like I was going to go into law school. I used to write. I used to read a lot more than I read right now. And, and, and for me, it was, you know, something something about um, humanities and, and, and probably uh, journalism or, or law school. But it was my last year of high school uh, where I got a, a, you know, I visited, I visited a few hospitals with my dad. I have a... a, a, a um, I think it was a biology project or some sort of a science project. And I decided to videotape. This is uh, on Betamax uh, for any of you probably don't even know what that is, but, you know, I videotape a, a, a surgery and a small surgery. And that was my science project at an A, you know. So I, I slowly just started going into me in the idea of going into medicine. And uh, yeah, I had to make a decision, you know, at age 16 when I finished high school. And basically applied to medical school at age 17. I started medical school, uh, which I finished after uh, is, is in many places in South America. Is uh, seven years of medical school being the last year, you know, the internship. Right. Awesome. So that's how I got into medical school. <laughs> awesome. And, you know, why surgery? What happened in that medical school that made you want to pursue surgery? <clears throat> it's another interesting fact. Um, I was actually not planning to apply to surgery either. So I actually was very, uh, um, you know, for me, and this is something that has followed me all along, you know, I get more passionate about the things that truly, cut, you know, make me more curious about. It. And I was very curious about GI disorders and the abdomen uh, appealed to me, but not from the surgical standpoint, from more so from the physiologic and pathophysiology standpoint. So I finished medical school. Uh, and I did my, you know, usual four internship rotation, like your medical school, you know, and I went through surgery, uh, internal medicine, pediatrics, and GYN. And I still was thinking I was going to do internal medicine residency to go into GI, in fact, gastroenterology. And, but just like many, um, and some people on the call may relate, uh, maybe our IMGs, you know, we had to serve a one year rural service, right? And this is mandatory. And I had no appetite to, you know, come into the United States or moving anywhere. So I, I, I had to do that in order to, to move into residency. So I went, uh, I tried to get a spot in this lottery of positions that usually send you to a small town in the middle of the Andes, but I couldn't get one. So I had to sign up for one of the uh, uh, forces. So I en ended up signing up for the Navy, expecting to stay. Well, if I'm not going to do one of these little town villages, I so stay nearby home, you know, in the main Navy base, which is in Lima, where I grew up. And, and Callao is a port nearby. Little I know that it was a Peruvian Amazon Navy. So I got uh, deployed to, you know, to be the physician on board of a little battleship in the in the Peruvian uh, Amazon. Um, even then, I didn't, I wasn't sure, you know, you know, what was that job looked like. But to make that story a little bit shorter, uh, I spend of that year spend almost five months or so if i have months almost half of the time that i was deployed there navigating the putumayo river that is between peru and colombia if there's any colombian the call they would know uh this is you know this is a river that delineates the, the border between our countries and at that time you know it's a lot of guerrilla in the uh, southern part of colombia and it's completely unpopulated in the amazonic side of the the peru side so they were opening military bases and our battleship essentially was going up and down this, this uh, Putumayo River. And 
it was a very rich life experience. I would say from a medical standpoint, for a medical standpoint, it was intermittently boring because you know I was I was in a in a battleship with 60 young healthy men, otherwise they wouldn't be deployed there. But I had the opportunity to, you know, when we, you know, in, you know, uh, tie or, or or spend time in the little villages across the river, you know, was very exposed to to a lot of infectious disease. And I, I was a, you know, kind of like a nerd, you know, like a book smart individual. You know, I, I kind of like nerd up in all these infectious disease. Me and and all the all the troop there got malaria at least once and maybe more. We we would just get tested. They they wouldn't evacuate us. They would just hamper down and 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 stay there. Um, but then I was also exposed to you know gunshot wounds, some uh, penetrating traumas, um, some blunt trauma as well. And also I had in two occasions, uh, mainly one, uh, an acute abdomen. Right. And this patient with right lower quadrant pain, you know, it's appendicitis, it's a, it's a kidney stone. And then, you know, that had a revelation at that time, you know, I was, as, as I say, you know, I was, was kind of very nerdy and I studied a lot and I felt that I could figure out a lot of things by studying and by reading and by using my, you know, skills. But I, uh, there's something that you cannot do and it's to solve surgical problems without training, right? So um, as, in Spanish, we have a saying, you know, a surgeon could be a good clinician, but a clinician may never be a good surgeon, right? So without training, so that changed my mindset. And, and you know, coming back from this year of rural service, I, I decided to go back and instead of, of applying to GI, I applied to general surgery residency. Awesome. So you did your general surgery residency in Peru first, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So in what moment does Dr. Polanco, freshly grad from his general surgery residency, decided to come to the U.S.? Yeah. So that that's also a process. I was, uh, you know, through medical school. And also, um, you know, I did, you know, I was very involved in, you know, mission trips and 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 even as a medical student, I kind of like walk and bust and uh, hitchhike a lot of places in Peru in an era where it wasn't that safe. So I'm very, pretty much in love with my country. And I never had, again, even then I didn't have uh, the plans of moving to the United States. Um, but I was doing my residency training and um Again, expo in, in urban uh, BC hospital. I had the previous trauma exposure in in you know in when I was deployed in uh, working in the rural service in the Navy, and then I got exposed to more trauma during my residency. And again, I was you know 24 years old. You know, you know, get, get really hyped and got a lot of adrenaline rushes just from trauma call. And I felt that that was my calling. I felt that trauma was something I wanted to do. So towards the end, uh, the last few months of my residence in Peru, I did a lot of away rotations. And I rotated in a very busy uh, trauma center in Cali, Colombia. Uh, same thing in another one, Brazil. And it they developed this kind of like small network of, of um, trauma surgery. And some of the Latino uh, surgical society members will know the Pan American Trauma Society is a very active society in South America and it has the sponsorship of big names in the field of trauma in the United States. So through that network, I uh, got to know a, a few surgeons from University of Pittsburgh, and I reached out to them uh, with the idea of actually doing a fellowship and then come back to Peru. Mm -hmm. So I was not in, in really thinking seriously about moving to the United States and living there. So that's how, that's how I, I, at least that's how it started, you know? Okay, you wanted to do a fellowship, but you ended up doing a residency, correct? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so you stay during your residency, but you're now, I mean, you're now a surgical oncologist, right? Yeah. You're, you're, you didn't end up doing trauma. What happened yeah. there? Yeah, it seems that uh, now that I'm telling the story, it almost seems that I never end up doing what I decided to do <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> but uh, I guess that's how it works sometimes. So I, um, I um, contacted these surgeons in University of Pittsburgh. I did an observership. This is right after finishing my uh, uh, finish, finished my residence in Peru. I was training, taking trauma and emergency call in a bunch of small private hospitals, trying to figure out what to do next and trying to get a position, a formal position in one of the bigger academic hospitals. So because you have that freedom a little bit, I was young and no, not yet major responsibilities. I did this away rotation in Pittsburgh, just on a pure observership, like many of uh, people in, in the in the call have done, and um, and the, I did this in University of Pittsburgh, and and 
during these two months, you know, I was observing cases, going to a trauma bay, going to the OR, but I was kind of bored. And the person who gave me the chance to visit and la later became my mentor, Andy Peitzman, he realized that I that you know I was already trained and I was very uh, you know very um, active and very eager and have some drive to do more stuff. So he actually gave me two floppy disks, and I'm dating myself again, you know. You know, two floppy disks, you know, the ones that many of you have never seen, but it's, it's kind of had the shape of the bottom where you save files in Word. <laughs> and uh, it had two databases there. And they says, will you mind finishing these databases and maybe we can write something to there? And that, that's what I did. You know, in, in those two months, I just spent my evenings uh, finishing this database and, and, and writing um, this paper first and then a second paper later. And I think I, that got his eye. So on my, you know, debriefing meeting towards the end, my exit meeting with him, I told him that my plans were to do a, a fellowship training, but I had I haven't taken any of my boards yet, right? In my USMLE, so I was gonna go back home, just you know, work in in uh, uh, odd jobs and take drama call or whatever, and study for my USMLE, and then come back. And he said, "Oh, I'll definitely support you." He he had a clear idea then uh, that I have very I was very invested in trauma and I had been exposed to a lot. Remind you, I mean, some people on the call may know, you know. You know, Cali in the early 2000s, late 1990s, you know, this hospital where I visited, you know, for three months, it was like 12 to 15 gunshot wounds a day. So I knew a lot about penetrating trauma and I was able to have an operative experience. So I think that's something that he valued at that time. And he told me, you know, I need this, I need to run this clinical trial and have this other research project. And I will be interested in you joining as a postdoc fellow. And, um, and he, it was a paid position that for me was very important. And, uh, you know, I, I feel very strong about it, you know, when it comes to research. And uh, mainly because I didn't have any other ways to sponsor my trip anyways. So he offered me that position. And that, uh, to me, makes sense, right? You know, instead of going to Peru, you know, I can just come to U.S., build some research portfolio, have the research experience, take my USMLE boards. And, and, and that was challenging, too, you know? Uh, I am so very grateful for, you know, the mentorship of, at that time of Andy Peitzman. He's, he's the person I own him being in the United States. And Juan Carlos Puyana, also a, a Colombian surgeon that was working there. And I was running this clinical trial and doing this basic science experimentation with, you know, swine, large animal. You know, I ran an entire setup, had to develop this, you know, figure out how to anesthetize large pigs and, and run these hemorrhagic shock protocols, studying cytokines. cytokines. And then in the afternoons, I was taking research classes at the School of Public Health. And and the very late at night, I was studying for my boards. So trying to do all these simultaneously. So it was a feat, but um, I'm glad I did it. You know, I think it, I, I learned a lot. Awesome. So now, you know, let's move to those clinical years at the University of Pittsburgh. What were the main differences you found doing your residency in Peru and doing your residency um, in Pittsburgh? Any anecdotes, something that you remember? That really was like, like, okay, this is different from what I've been training on. Yeah. So, so as a fully trained surgeon, right? So the part that I didn't mention is, you know, at some point I had a sit down with my mentor and he said, are you sure you want to do a fellowship and go back to Peru? Because I feel like you're going to really like to, you're really going to like to stay here and maybe build a, a, a career in academia. And I think this is the first take home message for, you know, the, the young surgeons or, or the young, um, you know, uh, physicians in their group sometimes your mentors know better so uh obviously you have to do what you what you want to do and if you're really passionate about something you're this you know you have made your mind uh, you should go for it but sometimes your mentors know better and, and you know for me you know what you know Andy Python and Juan Poyana told me you know what I think you should go through residency again because you can do the fellowship then then go back to residency but the concern was the gaps in the training, how to build up the story uh, uh, later on when you want to apply for for fellowship. So, yeah, so I was convinced that I had to do residency, and that was a that was a major first decision there, not going back to Peru and staying there. And I was lucky that they um, liked me enough to give me an opportunity in, in Pittsburgh. So I, I, that's where I did my residency. But going back to your question, you know, I, I you know I felt confident because. In general, yeah. I consider myself a confident individual of a fully trained surgeon. And I felt like, you know, there's, there can be that many things that are gonna surprise you in residency, but it's the, the training is very, very different. So from one is the medical system, right? How um how the medical system runs and 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 just the dynamics in 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 the different teams approach for 
a bunch of different service lines in, in surgery. The second piece that for me was very, very difficult to understand or navigate at the beginning is uh, the, the, you know, the use of narcotics. I have no idea how to use narcotics. You know, I, you know, in our, my country, you know, it's, it's NSH for everything, you know, big laparotomy, you know, thoracotomy, everybody goes home and Tylenol or something like that. So we, I had to learn how to use narcotics and I was actually afraid of, you know, <laughs> overdosing somebody. Later time we'll have, you know, uh, uh, tell the truth about narcotics and how much we were using them, you know, early, early when I, in the first years when I was in the United States, things that are in the news now. And then the other thing was the absurd amount of acronyms that we use here in the United States, right? So my first day in rounds is like, uh, hey, hey, Polanco, yeah, get a CBC, CMP, you know, uh, talk to the LTAG and a sniff, you know, it's like, oh my God, what, what is it? What are all these things? So I didn't have a strong background in medical English, I have to say. I mean, I, I, would, I would read and write just fine, but just in the day-to-day -day dynamics, uh, uh, it's, it, was, it was really challenging. I remember... One of the trauma surgeons at, at you know, there's a pistol one time called me to the office and hey, hey, you need to start you need to stop writing sniff like S N I F F when you say transfer this patient to the sniff facility. <laughs> There's a little bit of faking until you make it. Um, but I had to learn fast. And uh, again, you know, those those are kind of like a few, a few differences. And then the other the other thing is that the level of sub sub specialization for everything, right? You have an infectious disease called infectious disease doctor. You have a major uh you know uh vascular access issue you call vascular or interventional radiology we did not have access to all those uh really high level uh specialty care lines in, in at least early on in peru awesome awesome yeah that's that resonates a lot with a lot of experiences we have you know as foreign medical graduates coming to come into a us but mm -hmm. um you know what what was throughout these years you know, you're now a well-established surgical oncologist. You know, what would you say was the greatest challenge you have faced so far to be where you are right now? Like as a whole, like as a, yeah. throughout the process? Through your career advancement, exactly. Um, I mean, I think that the, the, the challenge is various. I don't think it's the same challenge all the time, you know? So thinking about, um, you know, in the context of the Latino surgical society, right? And acknowledging that there's a lot of um, IMGs in the call and people that from different backgrounds, often un underrepresented, I think. Uh, and I think I would say that something that it was always in my mind that uh, that I, I didn't have a label for it, you know, is the feeling of belonging, you know? Am I in the right place? You know, do I belong here, right? So... <clears throat> You know, when I when I'm you know matching um, surgery in in Pittsburgh, for example, you know, I, I look around, you know, it's like kids coming from you know Hopkins and kids coming from you know Yale or uh, Vanderbilt University, you know, and 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 you know, I'm from University of San Martin from Peru, which nobody knew, right? So is this idea that am I in the right place and do I belong here? And that's where you know a little bit of I learned later, you know, that, you know, the term that you now is very popular, the imposter syndrome, right? And I think that those things, uh, if you're not able to handle it well, and it's not that I have a trick or, or a, a, a way to, to tell everybody in the call how to navigate that, but I think that imposter syndrome limits you in a way that, uh, you know, cuts your wings a little bit. So if you're not able to overcome that, you could, you could, um, it's hard to navigate some of the things in uh, academic medicine and surgery training as a whole, I think. So, um, you know, I think I'm, thankfully, I feel that I'm a confident individual and, and I was able to identify some of these, uh, you know, things. But I think that having an imposter syndrome, uh, it happens a lot to many of us, you know, foreign medical graduates that come to the United States. I think that's a big one. Um, I mean, the other ones I think are seasonal, you know? You know, you you start, many of us start like young and no kids, no responsibilities. And you, you know, go a hundred miles per hour in your academic career, but then you get married and then you have kids and then some health issues, you, your family, or somebody else. So, so trying to, you know, identify that the pace that you should, uh, uh, or the amount of energy that you should allocate in each of these different buckets of your life 
is important. So I think that that's a, that's that has been a challenge also over the years. But you know, you you learn as you go, and I think that uh, it, it's it's doable. It's definitely doable. It's just I have to be mindful of it. Awesome, awesome. And what do you do to keep yourself motivated during those times? Motivated yeah. um, to overcome that imposter syndrome. You mentioned you mentioned that you were confident, but you know, any specific, you know, kind of like mantras, repeating yourself, something that, you know, <laughs> really helped you push through that. Yeah. The uh, nice for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I don't know if I have a mantra, but um, I think, uh, I think just uh, um, re rationalizing things is important, right? I think that many of us, or at least in my, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to make the move and leave Peru is that at least at that time, I feel like the value of an individual or a professional was not rewarded in a way it should be. And I was not able to establish a practice the way I wanted, right? Even now, like if I go back to Peru, you know, 70, 80% of my practice is robotics. I wouldn't be able to practice in Peru, but I didn't have that vision. I think that I feel like uh, I felt like when I was exposed as a, you know, as a research fellow in the United States, I always felt like in the United States, you work really hard and you put, you know, all your sweat equity on something, it usually pays off. I don't, don't see the same constant, you know, in many places, at least where I came from, may have changed now, but I didn't feel it was quite the same. So on those lines, in the United States, I feel like the American system and the American dream or the rewarding system of the American dream it's not for free, meaning if you are in a very highly selected uh, 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 group of individuals, and namely the surgeons in the call right now, or, or the physicians that are just coming from South America and they, you guys pass your steps with really high scores and now you're here in the United States, you are already a, a, a part of a selected group of individuals. So you need to rationalize that. You need to you know, believe that if you're here, it's for a reason. And you you deserve it. You own it. You you work really hard for that. So that's I think how I um, I think we at least for me it worked for me to convince myself that uh, that I belong here. You know that I that I'm where I'm supposed to be. And nobody gave it for free because in the United States, in the same way that people get rewarded, you know, by the effort they put in, they don't give you things for free. So if you are in a top uh, you know program in the country in anything or in a in a in a research position, you are already part of the uh, uh, elite group of individuals. So believe it, own it, and you know, run with it. Awesome. Um, what you know, if you could give some advice to that John Polanco, what would it be? What would you tell him? To uh, to whom? To, to oh. yourself, to your younger self, to that John oh. Dr. Polanco. <laughs> yeah. An advice. Advice. A word of advice. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that uh, in the lines of what I've been saying, you know, I would tell myself uh, to pace myself, right? Uh, not everything needs to happen on day one when you show up to the work, you know? I, you know, I, I, I was frustrated when I started residency in Pittsburgh, you know, that I wanted to be the best day one, but there was so much more for me to learn that has nothing to do with medicine or surgery, right? Because that part, I kind of I had a good background. I was already a fully trained surgeon. Um, so uh, just pace myself, you know. Right up, you know, first day at work, you know, my first real job. I was like, I wanted to have, I want to dominate all the surgeries. I wanted to have a full schedule. I wanted to have, uh, uh, you know, grants uh, uh, outline and you know funding, you know, within the first year. So nothing has to needs to happen the very first day, you know. So I think I would tell myself, pace myself, and don't don't get frustrated. If things don't happen at the pace that you think they should, um, and and then uh, I'll tell myself something that I've been telling myself through through the process is just to, uh, but I don't do it enough. I don't do it often, but I do it, and when I do it, it always feels rewarding. So just take a pause, take a deep breath, look back, you know. Uh, you know, look back at how much you have accomplished up to this point and savor it, you know, enjoy it. Because, you know, it's it's like, you know, some poet or song said, uh, you know, it's written, you know, it's not the destination, it's the journey, right? 
So we, I think we need to enjoy the journey. And sometimes when you're in these, you know, super intense uh, working habits or uh, uh, academic life, sometimes we don't make a pause or, uh, to enjoy it. So that's that's probably what I will tell my young self. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, following on these importance of mentorship, you've been mentored by great physicians throughout your career. Um, you know, what would you tell a medical student, a foreign medical graduate looking for a mentor? What quality should that mentor have? Because I believe it has to be like a right fit, right? So the right mentee with the right mentor. What advice would you give to that med student looking for a mentor in surgery? <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think that uh, you stated the right way. I, I don't think it's uh, the same mentor is going to be equally good for all the mentees. So there has to be a fit. But I think there are some general qualities, maybe or general uh, characteristics. You know, I think one um, in general. You know, the, 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 there's so many opportunities for research. I feel like nowadays, and. Uh, I see some names on the call right now, and I kind of remember talking to some of you guys about mentorship in the past. So number one is like, make sure you find a mentor that is in a field that is aligned to your interests, right? So if you want to come and, and when you want to do general surgery residency, you know, don't find a mentor that is a PhD in microbiology, right? Because may not be aligned with, you know, with what you want to do. And if you're not passionate about the topic that you're researching, it's not going to, you know, you're not going to have these great ideas or great motivation, maybe to to get what you want to do. So find a mentor that is aligned with the interests of what you want to do. That's number one. I think uh, second, uh, find somebody that is uh, um, approachable, uh, uh, something that you can have access to and have time to discuss ideas. Um, you know, I have, through my academic life, I've interacted with other mentors, not in the same role for me, but there are big names on the field, you know, you know, with big number of publications and big, uh, you know, uh, a big repertoire or, or research portfolio, but then none of, not, they're not approachable, you know, so, and, and mentorship is just much more than somebody tell you, hey, do these projects or write this paper or, or look at this data set or, or you know, isolate these cells or do these Western blots. You know, there's a lot more that comes uh, with, with mentorship. So I think that um, having somebody that is approachable, it is important. And, 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 and maybe just, I would say, knock doors, you know, indiscriminately, just go knock doors and try to find somebody that, that clicks with you, you know, with your, with everything, you know, I always, uh, say it, and you heard me saying this before. You know, I personally, when I look into a, an applicant, I uh, that apply for a research position or residency, for that matter. When I'm interviewing applicants for residency, I'm not only care about the IQ component, the, the intellectual component, but also the EQ, the emotional intelligence component of the applicant, because this is a team sport. Surgery is a team sport. A research lab or a research team is a team sport, and if these members cannot interact or have enough. EQ to interact dynamically with the rest of a team doesn't matter if the guy is like a, a genius, you know, it, it may not fit well. So I think that the applicants should also look for the same qualities in, in their mentees. That awesome. That, that's very, very insightful. And, you know, following back, piggybacking on this answer, the following question is about foreign medical graduates. You're an IMG, I'm an IMG. What, you know, one of the main questions we always make to ourselves is what qualities do I need to have in order to be successful in a career in surgery? So, you know, what about, what, what would you tell them? How can they achieve that goal of pursuing a career in surgery in the U.S. to a foreign medical graduate? Oh, man, so many aspects. So you're saying for an IMG, because the classic question this time of the year is for an IMG to match in surgery or for somebody to build an academic career in the United States or, or, you know, because, because the, the, well, it's a little, they're all a little different, right? Uh, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if there's, there's qualities that are appreciated across all the aspects of your career, right? Yep. Um, the training is arduous and difficult and demanding. 
um, it requires a lot of drive, a lot of uh, you know being proactive and and, and 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 highly motivated and resilient, right? So I think those are qualities that are good for anybody to endure not only general surgery training, but also to to just accomplish your objective, your objectives and and you know take a project from point zero to fruition, right? So I think those those qualities are are important for everybody. Now, if you're asking me, uh, you know, for an ING trying to look for a position in the United States, I think that is that is multifaceted as well, right? I I do think that uh, what I felt once in the past and even now is like the the usual same things, you know. Currently, having a uh, you know a a, a decent uh, uh, decent scores, although I know the scores are going away, but trying to have some sort of decent scores because even though many program directors I feel like they say that they they don't look at the scores anymore I, I do think that the first pass has to do with that because there's, there's no other way for them to compare you against their the U.S. graduates so I still think that's one thing the second one is um, have some um, you know uh, research uh, capabilities important mainly if you want to build a career in, in academic medicine and I don't think that all of it has to be United States. The benefit of doing research in the United States or having some academic, uh, you know, a scholarly activity in the United States prior to residency is that that has developed some network likely and you have a mentor in the United States, which is the third component. Have somebody to pick up the phone. I, I, always, I always say that anybody that has talked to me or asked me about this, sometimes your CV, Andresa Brew has, you know, you have 280 on your... USMLEs and and you know off the charts, but <laughs> for somebody to, to send you an invitation, they need to open your 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 CV. And sometimes I think many of us IMGs uh, are these are overlooked. Um, and you know the uh, I, I think well, those are the the three main components. But the other thing is like once you get once you get to an interview and throughout your career, tell a story. I think you need to tell a story. You know. So you need to be, be able to tell a story and you're going to see these, all, you know, you, you think you write a personal statement right now for application to residency, but you need to write a, a personal statement for your fellowship application. And, and when you, when you apply um, for a grant, you need to write a letter of intent. And when you apply for a new job, you know, even higher levels of position, you need to write a, like a letter of intent for that position as well. And I think the, the thing that the, the most, um, compelling the story that you tell in any of those personal statements you know whatever they, whatever whatever you're applying for i think it's it is important you know people like stories and and i think like in in this time of social media and you can quickly acquire notoriety and and supposedly fame or or, or at least some uh, level of uh, um, uh, you know visibility I think it's important to be able to have a compelling story that has some substance too. So there. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That, that, that's, that's great. And you kind of like avoided answering the question about why didn't you pursue a career in trauma, but I'm going back to, you know, <laughs> asking you that again and following that question with what advice would you give to residents that want to pursue a career in surgical oncology? Yeah. Well, well the, the story, uh, as it goes, uh, you know, yeah, so trauma brought me, and, and trauma is still love. Don't get me wrong; I love trauma. I did a lot. I had a lot of breadth experience in trauma, and and it's still one of my passions. But I think that um, as I was uh, during my residency training, I realized that trauma in the United States has a heavy component of critical care that I appreciate, but I don't like as much as being in the operating room, and uh, and it has to do with the epidemiology of your trauma, right? I you know came from uh, South America, where uh, was exposed to trauma centers, where you know penetrating trauma accounted for seventy percent, you know, and thirty percent was you know uh, 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 blunt trauma. While the United States is kind of like the 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 opposite uh, ratio, and you know I enjoy still trauma, but I felt like uh, you know it was not as operative as I wanted to be. You know, for those that know me, I love to be in the operating room. I love to be busy, and. At the same time, I was exposed at the University of Pittsburgh to a very complex level of, of surgical oncology that was very unique and it was very, um, 
cutting edge you know we're starting that's where you know the robotic pancreas experience was starting the robotic liver experience high uh hepatic artery infusion pumps isolated liver perfusion isolated limb perfusions things that honestly i not only did not see in peru but most centers across the united states were not doing it so that just essentially blew my mind and and i gravitated slowly to these complex uh, uh surgical oncology operations so that was a that was a that was a tough conversation to have with my mentor then because i felt like you know you know they were grooming me to be a trauma surgeon and likely even stay at, at, at uh, maybe there um but i remember having this conversation and calling to my mentor and i was nervous like i've never been before you know with Andy Pisman, telling him that you know i was a pgy3 now and i was like you know the replacement i don't think i'm gonna go to to trauma i want to do surgical oncology and explain my reasons kind of in a uh, uh um brief manner and he stood up, you know, he, this guy's like, you know, six, five, although when he's a mentor, you, you think he's like eight feet tall, you know, and he put his hand on my shoulder. He's like, Patricio, if you're happy, I'm happy, you know, and uh, I think that's what a good mentor uh, is supposed to do. And that's what I do with my, with my mentees. I have many research fellows and or, or residents that have shift gears away from surgical coding to something else. And I welcome that because... If they're happy, you know, that's the, that's the ultimate joy that they will get. It's the ultimate joy that I get, you know. So I think that's 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 the story. That's how I shifted gears. And now regarding the, for for uh, residents going into surgical oncology, right? I think it's uh, uh, the same, you know. I think that first, not all surgical oncology looks the same, okay, because you know, I, I have uh, uh, medical students that, you know, scrub with me in a 14 hour long high pick operation, you know, and they're like, oh my God, how, how can you like this, right? So, but first, not all surgical oncology is like that. Thankfully, you know, surgical oncology has a lot of different flavors. You can be a breast surgeon, surgical oncologist, and you know, do four cases and be done by 2 p.m. and, you know, enjoy your life in our activities or go to back to your family. You can do, you know, endocrine surgery. That's also part of the field of surgical oncology. You can do uh, melanoma sarcoma. So there's different in, in levels of intensity and, and uh, um, kind of demands from, from the field. So don't be dissuaded if you have a, you know, a bad or the clinically heavy duty surgeon rotation. There's a lot of different ways that you can fight cancer. Um, I would say that it's 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 demand it's demanding in general the training, but it's very re rewarding. You know the level of connection that you have uh, with the patients is uh, I don't think you can compare with it with many other fields, and the the, the 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 relationship that you develop with them it's particularly unique. So if you if you enjoy that and, and you enjoy um, you know the the disease process that you which cancer you're fighting you know I think you should you should pursue it. And at the same time, build yourself a story. It doesn't matter if you, I mean, I have residents, you know, in our program that have decided to do surgery on the first few months of PGY-5, no previous research. And th there's a way, but you need to tell a story, right? You need to find a compelling story to tell in order to, you know, to pursue that training, matching that fellowship, and then later on build your career on that. I see. And, you know, now let's kind of like shift gears towards the research. You're a very successful researcher. You know, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How can you build a leading high and leading a high impact uh, research program? What are the keys to do that? And also, how can you use that research to advocate, for example, for Latino patients? Okay. So, how to build a, a research program? I, I mean, I, I. So first, I'm gonna do a disclosure here. You know, I, I like to say. Um, I'm a, I'm a, you know, clinician that does research, you know, you know, you could label, I've been, I've been presented as population scientists, you know, because I do a lot of, you know, large data and population science and access to care, et cetera. I've been presented as, you know, educator sometimes, or, you know, um, sort of educator because of my, you know, simulation training, robotics, like kind of stuff. Um, but I have to say, you know, I'm going to. I've been a blunt statement, you know, many people may or may not agree. 
it is thought of that you have to it is often sell the sold the idea that uh that that if you want to be in academia you have to do research i don't think that's necessarily the case okay first and foremost because i know a lot of people look for research positions or try to get into the lab to then match in the fellowship but we're you know one of my partners writing a very interesting paper showing that the grand majority of people that wrote in their statement about the sort of concord that they want to do basic science research and build a you know a, a, an academic practice in that they don't even go into academic practices you know so it is not mandatory and i want to emphasize that when i was dreaming about coming to united states and i don't know what was your dream andres or what is the dream of the people on the call i'm not sure how many are dreaming oh i want to do a western blot in a big lab in a you know or i want to uh, you know, work with some mice in the lab and discover this molecule. I think just very few of them, right? So I'm going to give a piece of advice here. I says, you define your own success, okay? And maybe that's the thing I should have told my young self. I define my own success. We always go by the model of the guy sitting next to you, right? R funded, NIH funded, or DOD funded, you know? That is great. I think that is fantastic. But I always try to remind myself of when I decided to come to the United States is to become a real good surgeon, you know? And I remember telling myself, I want to be the surgeon that get other surgeons out of trouble, you know? And I, and that takes time and it takes, you know, 10,000 hours of surgery and probably 10 years of practice, but that's what I wanted to do, you know? The other things are, it's the collateral effect of being in an academic environment that is often you know, very rich and, 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 and that invites you to have research questions. So going back to your question of how to build a research program, well, make sure you do research in something that motivates you, that really sparks your interest. Don't do research for the sake of doing research or because you have to put a paper out. So if you are in a fertile environment and you have uh, the support of, you know, and could be, it can come in any source, I'll tell you, I would say that my, my most impactful papers have resulted of research initiatives that were unfunded, zero funding. And 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 I have funded, you know, through the VA when I was there and recently got, you know, from, from the cancer center, you know, got a million dollars. But I, I think that if you have a really good uh, focused interest on something and you read about it, the right research question will come up. And then you rail around the, what resources are needed to do that, right? Uh, I mean, I will quote the research that you do that uh, for me is fascinating. You know, I remember, you know, for the audience, you know, I will tell that when Andres joined the lab, he says, you know, a couple of years ago, I was like, you know, this is space of surgery, education, robotic training and simulation is relatively new to me, right? But to me, it was the perfect uh, 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 sequence of events. First, you become a content expert. So for those already in junior faculty positions, I always say, become a content expert first. For me, it was dominate the pancreas, dominate robotic surgery of the pancreas. And, and um, you know, with that, then you can, you can move to the next, you know, phase. And then is assess your local resources. And, and that will tell you, you know, what do you have to do research for? And third, I would say, look for collaborators. You know, a lot of our most research endeavors in, in video-based assessment and robotic uh, uh, surgery research is from data that is unmanageable for us, right? It's video-based assessment. So we need to knock the door of, you know, uh, uh, bioengineers and machine learning experts and AI uh, experts, you know? So I think that's the best way to build a team because, you know, again, if we all, if we all have on site the same goal and the same interest, and the same passion and drive for the topic, I think things will come just uh, as, a, as a result of it, not in spite of it. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm being told that we we need to, I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to open the, the the chat for questions from the audience. If anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them now. So what do you think was the most important thing you got from the Almenara Hospital to be able to get where you are? Mm. So, I think uh, that this, I mean, our hospital, for those who know, that's that's a hospital where I train in, in Peru. Uh, and honestly, the reason what I, you know, I, I, I applied for a residency position, I was able, I was ranked high enough to um, 
to choose which hospital I will do my residency in Peru. This is like a, you know, almost like a university based but national uh, exam. And um, the reason why I went to Amenara because of all the hospitals in Lima was more cutting edge. So they were doing the most amount of laparoscopy. Uh, there was the, it was the only hospital at that time that was starting to do uh, transplant. And I think I was exposed to surgeons that were not afraid of trying new things. I remember the best laparoscopies will go and observe in France, observe in the United States for three, four months, and then come back and apply that knowledge. And to me, it was fascinating. You say, wow, just, just, just going and learn by watching and coming to this. So I think that, um, that uh, um, appetite for learning new things and doing new things, I think I, I, I definitely, you know, that was the started probably, you know, Menara, um, among of working with excellent colleagues and, and coro, coresians and faculty. Interesting. And here's here's another question, for example. Uh, do you think that having, I mean, that the fact that you did your residency previously was an important factor helping you to match into residency? Like having that previous experience, do you think helped you to get through the match? Or do you think it actually helped you after the match? I mean, I think it helped in both scenarios, right? But I have to tell you that... Um that uh is how you sell the story i remember going to an uh, interview and and the guy who was interviewing me says you know what we had a previously a trained surgeon that ing that came trained and in as a pgy1 he was so condescending he was looking you know their interest over his shoulder like he was you know very very special and he would challenge you know the 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 commands of you know his senior residents so that you know that that for example in that particular interview I don't think that having been a previously trained surgeon was helping me right but then you need to sell the story that that you know that that you're a different individual right I, I think I was able to manage that relatively well you know put my head down when I had to put my head down being humble be a team player never acted like I was you know a superior individual because uh, to my peers because I was already fully trained. And just do the work, you know, and obviously patient safety first. I had to step up and say things when I felt like, you know, something was not safe. And I used my background and my knowledge to make those statements. But I, I think I did it in a humble, humble enough way that I didn't hurt anybody's feelings. So, so yes, it could help, but it could also hurt, as I explained. And yes, the experience always helps, you know. I, I was, I felt like I was confident in, in most of the basic stuff in general surgery. Okay. Um, here's another question from Felix from Ecuador. Um, he, he, he says, I dream to be a surgeon in the U S right now I'm doing research in my country in surgical oncology. I would love to research fellow in the U S prior to the match, but if I do it, I will be six years since I graduated from medical school. Should I go directly into residency instead? That, I mean, that's a personal decision. You know, I was, I finished medical school let me think about this yeah I was five or six years out of medical school when I when I uh applied for residency six years actually when I started residency so yeah so close to seven years so um everybody's different you know and and as long as you can tell the story when you apply I think it's it's possible you know like you need to you don't need to do a compelling story this is what I did this is what I, what I spent my time you know, if, you, if you're able to tell a compelling story, I don't think that would necessarily be a bad, uh, a bad uh, issue. Uh, but it, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a personal choice. You need to assess your, your odds. Awesome, awesome. Um, we we really appreciate the questions from from the audience that you're very excited because you're here, boss. You're a celebrity in the IMG community. So, <laughs> so uh, but unfortunately, we we have to move to the next session. Um, the next part, sorry, of the session that is about rapid fire. One or two words to answer these questions, and 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 that's it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the first one: What is your favorite city? City, uh, globally, right? With speaking, yeah. Um, just by the head, uh, I think Bali, Indonesia. Bali, Indonesia. Okay. Um. What is your favorite surgery to perform and why? Uh, believe okay. it or not, it used to be laparoscopic right collectively. I think I was telling you that as you were watching me doing one. 
but uh, it has right now it's either a robotic weapon procedure or a very good uh, uh, robotic enucleation of an insulinoma. Those patients get immediately better. It's a very fine surgery, and 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 they're they're home in day two or three, and they just do well. Okay. Um, what is your favorite type of food? I'm basic guy. I'm a good uh, meat and potatoes guy. So a good a good steak will do, or obviously up there is a uh, Peruvian food, a good Peruvian ceviche, probably. What's the best advice you've received? The best advice I received, um, so many. Um, one word. In one word. Yeah. I'll just pull this advice. This is this is tricky, but I'll tell you the same because this is in the topic. This is actually stuck here. Can you read this? Probably not. When I was traveling to negotiate one of my first jobs, you know, I was sitting in the American Airlines flight and I got this magazine. And I, I don't even know what is this advertising. I think it's like a leadership or, or a negotiation skills says. It says, you will not get what you deserve. You will get what you negotiate. So tying it up with all the imposter syndrome things that we talk about and the, the feeling of belonging. At the end of the day, not right now when you're negotiating internship positions, you probably just have to get it done and you're not going to negotiate your salary. But when you capitalize in the... Uh, immense amount of effort that I know most of you are going to put during your career lives, make sure you own it and, and are able to get recognition for it. So yeah, there, that's the advice. That That's great yeah. advice. Uh, what are the three things you can't live without? Can't? Um, can't yeah. uh, for sure. My family first, my four daughters, um, my wife, of course, uh, that's the first. Uh, coffee, okay. <laughs> uh, good, uh, a good coffee or um, mate for that matter. And then um, I think being exposed to patients and, and surgery, you know, I just, it gives you me, you know, a reason for being here. Awesome. Um, how do you start your day? Coffee, for sure. Okay. Coffee or mate, actually, now lately. Yeah. Uh, yerba mate. And I guess the, the last rapid fire question, uh, Messi or Maradona? Uh, may have been different. You asked me a year ago, but uh, uh, Maradona. Okay, got it. Uh, Still all school, I guess. I think so, yeah. Awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for to the audience and thank you so much to the Latino Historical Society. Thank you so much, Andres, for the opportunity uh, to share this hour with you. And really, to all the leadership of the Latino Surgical Society, uh, it's it's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope to see the society growth and, and, and witness all the great things that the society is doing for our community. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you to both Dr. Patricia Polanco and Dr. Andres Abreu for joining us for our latest installment of Inside the Operating Room. We would also like to thank you for tuning in this evening. If you're interested in learning more about the organization or becoming a member, you can find us at latinosurgicalsociety.org and on various social media channels at Latino Surgery. And the recording for this event will be on our YouTube channel shortly. And again, thank you so much. I really enjoyed hearing the stories, the conversation. This was fantastic. And again, buenas noches a todos. Thank you very much.